Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, tonight we have Mary talking to us about bees and plants and, you know, how best to, to leverage uh, one uh, with the other and how best to, to uh, feed your bees in your garden. Um, so I'll just, I'll just hand over to you and let you go with this. Thank you, Brendan, that's perfect. Uh, yes, and before I begin, I hope you will forgive me for doing an advert. The advertisement is for the All Island Pollinator Plan. We now have a new version, our second version. As you probably know, I'm the Federation representative on the steering committee of the Pollinator Plan. Very proud to be there. And the new plan is now available. If you want to see it, you should go and look at it, by the way. It's on biodiversityisland.ie. Um, it's extremely good and it has a whole section on doing good things in your gardens. In fact, you can even join it and register your garden as a bee-friendly zone. I would like to encourage you all to do that immediately. That's the end of the advert. What I really wanted to talk about today is the, the mutual benefits that bees and plants confer on each other. Well, we, of course, as beekeepers, uh, understand this in, an, in a particular way. We understand it because our bees thrive in environments which are free of chemicals and which have lots and lots of flowering plants all year round. I stress that it needs to be all year round because as you will have seen over the last six, three months, four months, there are days when it seems like we're getting into May and the temperature goes up to 18. And then there are days like today when the temperature is down to two. This is difficult for our bees. They break their winter cluster and they need to be able to forage successfully, preferably reasonably close to the hive. And the plants I shall be talking about are all close to hives that I keep. And I have pictures of bees in all of them. So you'll see that bees actually use these plants. The winter period may seem like the most difficult, but in fact, I believe it's not very difficult. The main thing is to make sure that you plant things which have lots of flowers. This will sound obvious, but it may not be so. People tend to think of early flowering bulbs, for example. Most bulbs, with the, ex the honorable exception of grape hyacinth, of course, most bulbs actually just have one flower, which is quite delightful for us, but not very useful for the bees. So I would like to encourage you to think in terms of useful garden shrubs, small trees even, but certainly something where you can be sure that a lot of flowers will be available over a period, maybe three, maybe three to four weeks, sometimes longer, sometimes maybe two months from some of these wonderful winter flowering shrubs. The reason I say this is it doesn't always uh, seem to be the way that people see shrubs. Shrubs are presences in the garden which are often rather overlooked. Fair enough. The shrubs I shall be showing you are not wonderful display shrubs. And my garden is anything but a display garden, I'm afraid. I'm not a great gardener, much as I love plants. What it is, however, is a place where I know bees and other pollinators can always find something to eat. And that has been my aim. So, but before I go on to show you my pictures of my flowers, I would like just to talk to you a little bit about this idea of mutualism and to ground it for you in the idea of biodiversity. I think biodiversity is probably the most important idea that I can offer you tonight. Um, one of the uh, entomologists that I particularly admire, a man called uh, uh, Eric Grissel, has a wonderful saying. He says, diversity is the basis of a balanced garden. And he means not just diversity of plants, but also a diversity of insects and other creatures that you may not like very much in your garden. Eric Grissel has an attitude which I think I've tried to follow and I found successful, which is don't be worrying about the green fly. Don't be worrying about the black fly invite the birds into your garden and they will polish off large numbers of those nasty creatures, especially in the spring. You've seen them, I'm sure, at the moment. 
If you have bird feeders in your garden, you'll certainly see them cleaning up the branches of your trees. And well, while they're doing that, they're actually bringing life into the garden for you to watch. I think the garden should be a place where you enjoy watching everything. I would like also to invite you to think about ways of bringing not just your honeybees, I hope you have bees in your garden if you have room, but also other bees into your garden. So I shall talk to you a little bit about the requirements for bumblebees. On the whole, I would expect you will see at least three or four different varieties, different species of bumblebees in your garden, wherever you are, even if you're in a very close suburb to a town, because it is true nowadays in Ireland that in fact, suburban gardens are probably the safest and most nourishing places for bees. This will seem a very sad comment. We know we've lost lots of hedgerows. We know that arable land gets plowed and, and there's nothing at all for any insects, any pollinators or anybody coming out of hibernation actually to eat. So I would like to encourage you to see your garden as a very important resource. And if you can spare some places in your garden for a bit of good old leafy rubbish, maybe some twiggy branches that you can't be bothered get doing anything with, just pile them up somewhere because you will find there is a wonderful variety of all sorts of life. You may even get a hedgehog, I keep hoping. We have on the past had hedgehogs in the garden. All sorts of creatures benefit from you not being very tidy. Now, I'm not saying you need to lose your beautiful flower beds or that you have to leave everything just lying about, though I do tend to do that myself. But one way and another, if you can have places in the garden which are available, let's say for bumblebees, also for solitary bees to nest in. All the six main species, the commonest species of bumblebees that we have in Ireland, all really are ground nesters. You know those great um, sort of tufts of really dense grass that you can't get the, the lawnmower through. Those tufts are likely to be the home of Bombus pascorum that I call the ginger bee. She's one of my favorites. She's a very beautiful bee because of her lovely ginger, ginger plumage, but also she's a very clever bee because she can feed from the flowers which have the deepest corollas, the deepest throats. She has the longest tongue of all the bees. So there's possibly a good reason for leaving that annoying tuft if it's to the side and you know near the compost heap, somewhere like that. Um, you will notice in the flowers that I show you that I'm showing you a number of things which are frankly weeds. I will warn you about them, but I want you to, to see that I believe with Eric Grissel that growing a variety, a diversity of plants, that may mean letting weeds grow is actually very, very healthy for the balance in your garden. We're all encouraged to leave the dandelions and the daisies in the lawn nowadays, cut the lawn less frequently. I, do, I don't see any reason why you would worry about that. The lawn still looks beautiful. Um, and just because you cut the heads off the, off the daffodils, sorry, off the, off the dandelions and the daisies, once they've sort of finished flowering, I wouldn't worry a bit about that. Uh, the main message really, I suppose, is to try and have a very diverse garden with lots of different places. That grubby place at the bottom of the hedge that you never can get anything to grow in, that's ideal for Bombus terrestris. She actually makes a tunnel and she goes down in there for her, for her hibernating nest and also for the nest in which she'll rear her brood. Now, this question of the mutuality of bees and plants really goes back to Darwin. And I wanted to quote something which I find quite amusing in Darwin. Darwin, as you may, have no, may know, was a great connoisseur of orchids. And when he discovered an orchid, which is now known as Darwin's orchid, when he discovered an orchid which had no less a, 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 a throat than a 12 inch one, he, he's supposed to have said, what insect can possibly suck that, right? Now, Two years ago, the National Geographic reported that 
the moth which actually fertilizes or pollinates this orchid has finally been found. And it does indeed have a proboscis, which is a foot long. Now that's what mutual, mutualism is really all about. This extraordinary fitting between plants and the insects that pollinate them, not just insects, of course, other creatures are also pollinators. This is one of the oldest stories of life on earth. And I want to take you back for a moment to 140 million years ago. This is the time when what we call the angiosperms, those are the flowering plants, start to appear generally all over the earth. It's quite an amazing period because once they moved from being what we call gymnosperms, which have no visible flowers, which just basically sprinkle out pollen either into the water if they're underwater plants or into the air like conifers do. Those plants, which we call gymnosperm, which means naked sperm, those started to develop into blossoming plants. Obviously a flower actually protects the pollen. Not only that, it also directs the attention of the pollinator to the nectary and via the pollen. So the shapes and forms of, of flowers always reflect the pollinators which they have a mutual relationship with. This is a terribly important shift. Darwin noted that there was an enormous increase in the number of different plant species at this period. The period at which we know the first pollinators started to work on the blossoms. I'm going to take you back now just to a mere 99 million years ago when the oldest, I would call this the oldest known bee uh, relative really, it's, it's somewhere between a wasp and a bee. This is called Melitus felix burmiensis, was found in a piece of amber in Burma. This extraordinary creature we know to be one of our real ancestors of bees for one simple reason. And the reason is that this wasp-like creature trapped in amber with pollen grains actually has branched hairs on its legs. Now the branched hairs are the way that the brushes, just like our copiculi on our modern bees, those brushes were collecting pollen. And that 99 million year old piece of amber has been a most vital link for us to understand the long and detailed and developing story of the mutualism between bees and plants. I ought to tell you it's not just bees that do the pollinating. I have come across recently a wonderful creature called the tumbling blossom beetle. And she was around at the very same time. And these creatures, they're called tumbling beetles because when they are attacked, they quickly flip out of the blossom where they're feeding on the pollen and fall. This odd behavior has saved them obviously many times. And more than that, it's also meant that they're actually very good pollinators. There are a lot of beetles that are good pollinators. You probably didn't know, and I didn't know until Jane Stout told me, that magnolias are really pollinated by beetles. Not much by bees. Pity really, because they are so beautiful. And you do sometimes see a bee resting in a magnolia blossom. I want to say something also about the need for diversity. When diversity is lost as we're losing it in our countryside, I fear. Then we have a very serious situation developing for all the network of creatures which depend on each other. The situation is really that instead of having a continuous uh, amount of forage around, that is a continuous environment in which they can, ex and they can exist, instead of that, we get patches left between fields, around towns, not close enough for the bumblebees, for example, to fly between the two the patches. So if it's a small patch, they will literally starve. This is why the importance of hedgerows is so extreme, because hedgerows, 
also the uh, sides of motorways and the sides of railway lines, which are covered in flowering, you've probably seen them right now, the beautiful flowering blackthorn. Those are vital connecting uh, passages, corridors, as we call them, for the pollinating insects and for the health of the environment. I think I will get on if, if it's all right with you and start showing you my pictures. I want to start in the winter and go all the way through the, the seasons, one plant at a time and talking to you about them. So I'm going to go to my first picture now. I call this shrub my bee magnet. As you can see, this photo was taken on the 1st of January. Maybe you can't see that. I don't know if it's actually dated, but it was taken on the 1st of January this year. And already there they were, the bees were out collecting pollen. One is collecting pollen and the other, as you can see, is not. She's just picking up some nectar. So you can see this wonderful plant is uh, capable of feeding bees everything that they need. Now, I have to tell you, she flowers for a very long time. She finishes really about February, but she does look pretty scruffy after that. You wouldn't plant her as a beautiful evergreen, though she is pretty well evergreen. But the blossom smells so sweet that I forgive her every year because the whole garden fills with the sweetest scent and the bees just have to come and enjoy it. I've seen so many bees. In fact, on a warm day in the winter, I can hear the hum of the bees as I maybe see two dozen bees foraging on this plant. Now, I will warn you again, it's not a cheap plant to buy, but, and you must remember, I'm like, I'm a beekeeper and a gardener and beekeepers and gardeners are pretty mean people. We don't like spending money. So if you know somebody with this plant, it does put out suckers. And that person may well be able and willing to give you a sucker of Daphne Bolua. The variety I have here is called Jacqueline Postil, and it's one of the finest. But any of these beautiful Daphnes which flower in the depth of the winter and still hold their flowers even through the cold, these are, I think, very, very valuable to my two hives of bees in the garden. So that's my star recommendation for the winter but it's not the only one. I want to just, this little apiary here, I just want to talk to you about it. It's obviously a woodland apiary, it's not mine, it belongs to Kiltern and Beekeepers, of which I'm the secretary. But what I wanted to talk to you about is that terrible weed that is growing all round. Now that weed, Petocytes fragrans, I discovered by looking it up in Zoe Devlin's wonderful book on wildflowers, that it was actually always planted in the old days around apiaries. And the reason is quite simple. This picture was taken in the depth of January. You can see there are no bees flying, but I wanted a picture of the petocytes. So in I went. And what it looks like, you'll recognize it. If you haven't recognized it in that picture, you'll recognize it in this one. There it is. It's a miserable little thing with horrible leaves. It dies down, however, if you have that around your apiary, I think you can say to yourself, you're doing your bees a good turn. Now, it's not a garden plant. It is very, very invasive. So be warned. Don't think you can get away with a small patch of that because it will, it will take a lot of care. <laughs> All right. But for an apiary, I would recommend it very, very highly. It's very good for your bees. So there we are still in the middle of January. And here again, January still going on. You can see this poor viburnum, which has no leaves, but it is putting out its flowers. This is a particularly nice one. This is viburnum bodnantensi, and it's a very fragrant one. And it's called Dawn because it's that lovely pinky color. And again, you can see that my bee there is picking up pollen. But again, this, this shrub has both pollen and nectar. And that, you can rely on that to be flowering in January. So there are three things which you can rely on year in, year out for a long, long time with no care virtually, just chop back bits when you don't like the shape uh, once the flowering's over, of course, 
one way and another, these are very valuable to your bees at a time when there's very little for them and you're not out in the garden very much, so you don't mind if they get a bit scruffy. So there we are, the Burnham bonantensi. Very easy plant. And finally here, my star January flower. I always love this plant, but it is a messy bush. Those are quite small honeysuckle flowers. It's called Lanicera fragrantissima. And again, it's a source of both nectar and pollen for the bee. You can see the bee there is heading in very intently to collect, collect some more pollen. And you can see that she must pass the anthers of the honeysuckle plant, the little anthers which are full of pollen. She has to pass them to get to the nectary, which is at the base, right at the bottom of that flower. So she has to stick her head right in there and poke her tongue in. And while she's doing that, doesn't she deposit some pollen, which she gets covered in, she gets the pollen onto the anthers. Now, this is very important. Plants in general, flowering plants in general, have mechanisms for avoiding just pure self-pollination. So it's actually quite interesting to know which plants prefer to have, you know, other plants around which are, which are good. And I would say this Lunicera, this one, I have no difficulty in getting it flowering for, for six weeks at least. Um, and again, it's really, really popular with the, with the bees, both bumblebees and the honeybees, which live next door to it. If you want to cut it down afterwards, after it's stopped flowering, just do. It, again, it's quite a scruffy bush. It probably would get out of hand if I, if I left it completely. But because it's so close to the hive, I do always chop it and it doesn't seem to mind. If you can gather what I'm like as a gardener, really, I like things which are very tough and can stand a good deal of neglect um, because I am just as interested in the bees as I am in the plants. And I'm off worrying about the bees in the other hives. So here we are, that's more or less the end of January. And I'm coming into February now. And here is a picture of hellebores. I wanted to give you some um, herbaceous. Hellebores, of course, are the winter flowering, the beautiful winter flowering pl plants. You will see them still in flower now, though they're more or less over. You can see there's a nice little Bombus protorum there. Um, you can see that she's a, a Bombus protorum because she has a ginger bottom. And she's feasting on the pollen and nectar, probably. Well, she won't be taking both. This bumblebee, I don't, I think bumblebees don't take both at the same time, like our honeybees, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, I found it very difficult to photograph, really, because I had to lie down on the ground. So here was me wanting to show you this for the very simple reason that I wanted you to realize, okay, she's looked at all those big shrubs, big shrubby things, but I don't have room for things like that. A, a dark corner of the garden, a place under trees will do beautifully for your hellebores. And your hellebores will increase themselves. They seed around, they're fine. And after that, you will have a whole bed, which is splendid for your bees and the bumblebees in the beginning of uh, early February. I can promise you that. They don't, don't, um, now this actually is important. I noticed in middle last year, and in fact, I'm very, I'm guilty, I bought one. There were some very beautiful and very um, unbee friendly double hellebores in little, and as I say, I did buy one. I'm warning you about those because double flowers, uh, that is with lots and lots and lots of petals, bred specially for that, make it very difficult for bees to get down to the nectaries. And many of them have no pollen at all. And this is the point at which I can warn you most severely about F1 hybrids. F1 hybrids, which is what most bedding plants are, are actually completely sterile. They do not have seed and they do not have pollen. 
So if you, if you like a big bedding display of F1 hybrids, your garden has become unbee friendly, unpollinator friendly. Not alone that, of course, a number of them have already been treated before you buy them with those neonicotinoids. You probably don't realize, but quite a number of bulbs and most, I would say, of the ordinary bedding plants, which you may buy imported, will have been treated with neonicotinoids. Now, I don't know if you want to bring that into your garden, but I certainly don't. I know it's harmful to bees and to other pollinators. And I would warn you, it's worth growing things from seed yourself. It's so cheap and seed is so easy and you're so proud of what you grow from seed yourself. And this is all about hellebores. Hellebore seed, if you sneak around the park and you find some seed ready to drop and you just take a little bit of it, that will sprout almost immediately. The seed you buy for hellebores, that takes ages. You have to stratify it. That means pop it in the fridge and all sorts of things. So I don't recommend trying to grow hellebores from seed unless you can just get a gardener to give you some fresh seed and then you can get started for nothing. Let me encourage you to do that with no nicotinoids. Okay, I'm going on. So after that, here we are and another bumblebee. <laughs> I wanted to show you this. This is a great favorite of mine and the bees, this plant. It's lungwort, pulmonaria. In fact, it's a herb and it's growing where I grow a great heap of herbs. Um, as you can see, this bumblebee, and this was in fact one of my small Bombus protorum or the early bumblebees, um, she has gone right into the flower to reach the nectar. That is about as clear a picture as I can give you of what the mutualism between bees and plants really looks like. The plant is actually offering the nectar and also the pollen. And that offering is being taken by the bee, who obviously will thrive on it. And in return, the flower is fertilized and can seed. So there's a beautiful symbiosis between the flowers themselves and the bees that pollinate them. Um, the lungwort itself I find a wonderful plant because of that beautiful blue. The flowers start with a wonderful intense blue and then once they're pollinated, lo and behold, don't they turn pink via purple? They're a lovely plant and they flower profusely and they flower early. Mine have a mass of flowers uh, all the way through March. Let me recommend that. Now, that's one more thing I want to say about this before I leave it, which is the ex extremely valuable um, use of herbs. You may be using herbs in your kitchen, but herbs are wonderful for bees. Almost all herbs are full of things that bees really like, whether it's something like sweet sicily, uh, umbellifery, or whether it's uh, comfrey, um, borage, all these beautiful plants that you can use yourself. You'll notice as I go through that I have a number of herbs sprinkled through the year. And the pulmonaria is one of the very early ones. So passing on. Ah, oh, yes. This is a pretty tough customer. Clematis serosa is one of the winter flowering clematis. And I value them, I think, more than the very gorgeous uh, ones that come in the early summer, because this is a time when there isn't very much flowering. And Clematis serosa freckles has not even been killed off by ivy. I don't know if you can see in this picture, but Clematis serosa was planted a long time ago against a fence. And then, as lots of things in my garden, a bit neglected. The ivy, which grows up the fence, started to compete. So what did Clematis serosa do? She goes over the top of the ivy. This means that I actually have, growing together, 
two plants which are awfully useful to bees. The ivy, the back end of the year in the autumn, produces, as we know, lots of pollen and nectar for the bees. And then as the ivy is finishing by the you know, midwinter, really, so Clematis cirrhosa starts thinking about flowering. And usually, so if it's a mild winter, then in late February and in March every year, she puts out these lovely little bell-shaped greenish flowers, which the bees really appreciate. And so there, I'm recommending Clematis cirrhosa freckles if you have a really tough uh, customer that you want to deal with something as, as uh, invasive as, as the ivy growing up the fence. And here's another one which you can't fail with and which flowers for a very, very long time. In fact, I'd almost say this does flower most of the year. This is a kind of wallflower, as you can see, and it's the one called Bowles Mow. It was named after the gardener called Bowles, a famous gardener in Wisley. Um, as you can see, it's got lovely pollen, and there's my bee picking up nectar from beneath where the pollen is. I recommend it also because it is very easy from cuttings. If you know somebody with bull's mauve, you don't need to buy a plant. You just say, can I have a bit of that? Can you give me a slip or two? And sure enough, they will root. Start now. Everything's coming into growth. Get on with it. You'll have bull's mauve for nothing and make your bees happy. Mm. I took this picture earlier this year, in fact, only a few weeks ago. I can't remember the exact date. It was towards the end of March. And it was a matter of great horror to me <laughs> this year that this plant, which as you can see is a pretty opulent rhododendron, um, was popular with the bees. I've had the plant and it's been in flower for a good many years. And I don't remember ever seeing bees in it before, but as you can see from this photograph, there comes the bee. She is already weighed down with pollen. Those of you who understand about this will realize that she's about to head back to the hive and the hive isn't very far away. I think what astonishes me about this is that I always believed that rhododendrons were not very, not very attractive to bees. But this year, uh, when the flowers have been very good, I have heard a dozen, upwards of a dozen bees and bumblebees in the rhododendron. Now, the reason I mention this to you is, I think you can say to yourself, well, this is a plant which I think is so splendid, I will put it in. I'll not have to do everything for the bees, but the plants will always appreciate the bees. One way and another, what I'm trying to say to you is, although you may want this because it's a beautiful, showy rhododendron that makes you feel very proud as a gardener, actually, it's still very good for the bees. And many, many plants which you would like to grow because they look so fine, will actually be fine for the bees. Just watch, watch and see who visits the plants. So there is, a surprise as I found it this year. This is no surprise at all. This is flowering right now. You can see the hellebores are more or less drooping over now, but the bush that's right beside them is Skimia japonica, very sweetly scented, masses of flowers. And this is the reason why I wanted to show you the picture. This, which is most of the year really quite a dreary little bush, not tall, not difficult in any way, will sit in the shade along with the hellebores. But at this time of the year, it covers itself with these multiple heads of flowers. Now, that is one of the clues that's most important of things which bees really like. They like a whole lot of flowers close together. It's an obvious economy, isn't it? They want to come and collect as much as they can on one journey as quickly as they can. And as you can see, that bee that's there on my skimmia this year is actually collecting pollen. Um, but both pollen and nectar are abundant in skimmia. I realize I might be running a little slow, 
So I'm now onto one of my, I'm onto one of my dire warning plants. When I came to this garden, I, which is a long time ago, I spent, I, I would say I spent about half the time I was out in the garden trying to get rid of Alchemet. I have ceased to try and get rid of it. It is a very rampant and difficult weed, but I have discovered various things one can do with it, and the bees totally adore it. Any day, any day at all, I can guarantee seeing honeybees and bumblebees on a patch of alkanet. It's um, a kind of borage, really. It's very closely related to borage, so you can see all the hairs on the stems. Don't pick it with bare hands. You're, you will regret it. It's better if you just put some gloves on. But this tough customer, which I can't get rid of, makes the most magnificent compost. It's full of goodness and it rots down very well. So let me just recommend, if you can or you have Alkanet, you already have it and you've been struggling like me <laughs> hopelessly, don't struggle any longer. Get out the shears once the blossoms faded and chop it all down and stick it in the compost heap where it will do a very large amount of good after having done all that good for feeding your bees. So there you are, Pentaglottis sempervirens. I'm forgiving you. I have to show you this. This is a, again, a nice plant that I like to grow. It's just damsons. It's a hedge plant. It doesn't require anything. It gives me fruit every year. I have to watch out because it sprouts everywhere from stones with the fruit that I haven't managed to pick. But the bees love it. It's early and it's very, very pretty. So any of the cherries with single blossoms, any of them is good for bees. I say single blossoms intentionally. The doubles are virtually useless to bees. Those beautiful petticoats that you see on the, on the flowering Japanese cherries, they are not good for pollinators to get into. So go for the simple ones, the bird cherry that we see in the woodlands, this one, which is the damson, which is a hedgerow plant, really. All of these are very easy plants to grow, not big, not rampant, really, and reward your bees and you. Fruit later, bees now. Ah, yes. This is the little preaching bit where I say, please let your dandelions flower. Please let your daisies flower. They are wonderful sources of food for all pollinators. You probably have heard a dandelion looks to you like one flower, but actually each one of those what seem like separate petals is in itself an individual flower. So when a bee comes there, she is, she's like being in a supermarket. Every place she looks, there is another bit of a feast because there are so many little flowerets in that head. You can tell that because when, of course, they have finished flowering and all those seeds go everywhere, you can tell just how many there are. So a good gardener wouldn't let it go to seed, but do let it flower. Now I'm into May and early May really, but early May when this picture was taken, but sometimes it's a bit later. Here are two plants which the bees do like. The one on the left, which I'm recommending and has the bee on it, is actually a, a, a geranium, not the kind of geranium that's a bedding plant. Those are pelagonums. This is geranium, which is really a native plant of ours. This one is geranium pretensi, and this is a particular variety called cashmere white. And as you can see, it's got a lacewing on it as well as a bee. Lacewings are very, very good for your garden. The lacewing grubs will eat up more green fly than you can shake a stick at. So here you have two pollinators, one who's giving you honey and the other whose offspring are gobbling up the green fly. And if that ain't very mutual, I'd like to know what is. And the other plant is Flomus Jerusalem sage, Flomus fruticosa. And you may see that that's sort of pea-shaped flower 
on the whole, plants with pea-shaped flowers are very good for bees. I'll talk to you about that when I come to sage in a minute or two. But before that, here is a plant that everybody should grow, some form of echium. It doesn't have to be this one. This one has rather, has rather grown. I was given a plant of echium candicans by a very, very nice gardener. And I, I planted, well, actually she gave me two. I planted both in um, pots. One turned its heels up, I thought, and died. So I stuck it in a corner. This that I'm showing you now is it. The other I tended terribly carefully. And at the end of the year, it just went, it, it was done. This echim is now about five feet high and five feet wide. And boy, does it flower. And look at the bees just loving it. All echiums, this is again native, its native name is bugle. All echiums are very, very popular with bees. And here is a thug. My dear aunt who taught me gardening always used to describe this little poppy as a thug because it does seed around rather a lot and it has quite big roots. But as you can see, it's very good for the bees and it's called Mechanopsis cambrica, the Welsh poppy. And I wouldn't be without it. There's a, an, an orange form as well as the yellow form. I call it oranges and lemons. And it's just something I'm very fond of and I see the bees in it every year. This is going into June now and I'm in the middle of the summer. You can see the forget-me-nots out and you can see Herb Robert flowering. All of those native weeds are very good for bees. If you've got a bit of a wild patch, why not let them go? Well, it doesn't have to be that wild. Here is a plant which I think is so elegant. This is another geranium. She comes a little bit later. This is geranium Mrs. Kendall Clark. Again, very easy from seed. I grew both those from seed, both Cashmere White and Mrs. Kendall Clark. You get many plants and you can give some to plant sales, give some to friends and grow some yourself. But all the geraniums, whether it's the native Herb Robert, whether it's something as, as frankly elegant as Mrs. Kendall Clark, all of them are very, very good for bees. We call them Cranesville. I don't know if you can see on the left of the picture, there's a seed pod which looks a little bit pointed. That's why they're called crane stills. Now, Salvia, sage, my favorite of all. I read in a, in a book, an Arab saying, which is, how can a man die who has sage in his garden? Because sage is so good for you. It has wonderful, mild antibiotic action. It is, wonderful as a culinary herb. It's very, very good for a sore throat. But look at the bee, doesn't she love it? Now the bee understands that flower. That flower is very complex. Where she has landed, there is, a, I don't know if you can see, just above her head, there seems to be something reaching out towards her, towards her antennae. As she moves into the flower, that comes down onto her. And as she goes right into the bottom of that little sage blossom, she will be collecting pollen involuntarily. And as she comes out, the pollen will be deposited in the next one. If you look below, you'll see that the, the flower below is quite wilted and has obviously already bloomed. She may pop in there, and if she does, just to see if there's still a trace of nectar, then she will enable that final bit of the pollination to take place. Because the way these blossoms work is, a, is almost like a two-phase pollination. So the bee is visiting this one, and then that one, and then the other one, and one half withered, and one just coming out. That is the really wonderful dance of the sage blossom and the, and the honeybees. If you'd like to read about this, it's beautifully described in a book that I love very much by a man called Morris Metalink, which is called The Intelligence of Flowers. Here we are, this is quite tall. This one goes to about five feet, but it's just ordinary meadow rue. 
as you can see, it's just packed full of pollen. And when it's really going strong, the bees adore it. Again, bumblebees and uh, honeybees. By this stage, I'm coming through to July um, and I've got lots of things flowering in the garden. And I hope most of them will attract the bees. This does very much. This is ordinary mallow. I call it ordinary. I can't imagine why, because it is a most beautiful plant actually, but it's so easy. And again, it's a native. This one, the white version um, is perhaps slightly uh, special. Again, you can see that the bee just gets coated in pollen as she visits this plant. It has both pollen and nectar. And if you'll just pardon me, um, taking you a little round this photograph, you'll see behind it, I've got that, you know, that really raggy old campanula, that beautiful bell that you can see, that's excellent for, particularly for the bumblebees. The bumblebees tend to be able to go much deeper into plants than our honeybees because they have longer tongues, or most of them do. And in fact, I hope Bombus hortorum, which has the longest, to longest tongue of all, might visit my campanula. That's the old nettle leaf campanula. And the sort of bright purple flower, that's another of the crane's bills. That's uh, Claris juice. And it, it really is so easy. They just romp around and look after themselves. I'm afraid that's the kind of gardener I am. And I, I actually love it. <laughs> But in my more um, academic moments, I love plants like this. This one might be regarded as more of a rarity. This is Eucryphia, a um, southern plant from Australia and, um, and New Zealand. And it is a, a particular variety called Nymanzensis, which has these large flowers. I was stunned at how attractive this plant is to the bees. This is a beautiful columnar evergreen bush that will grow to about maybe 15 feet, maybe not much taller than that. So it keeps its leaves all year. It's a lovely shape and it does cover itself in these scented white blossoms in July. Um, if you have a place where you want something really spectacular in July, this Eucryphia nymazensis is certainly a candidate. Oh, ho. yeah, I had to show you this. Couldn't believe my eyes when I took a picture of this. You can see it's a pretty wet day, but haven't we all been told bees don't like red? Haven't we all been told red doesn't attract bees, right? The reason is, of course, that they don't see red, but they do see the pollen guides that red flowers and all flowers have. So they do see the ultraviolet. They see what we see as red. They see the ultraviolet pollen guides guiding them into the throat of the plant to collect the nectar and also the pollen. And as you can see, there is old Crocosmia, which is again, a rampant sort of a plant, but wonderful, always gives a very good display. And there she was just heading in to get her reward. Her herbs still. This is fennel, ordinary fennel, um, funicularum officinale, and it is a multiple flower head. As you can see, the offering of the pollen on the anthers is almost irresistible to the bee. She just wants to get her, her tongue onto it. You can see her coming down to take it. Um, there is a more decorative form of fennel, which I also grow, which is the bronze form. And I would very strongly recommend that. Again, highly reliable, tough, uh, beautiful heads of flowers and so handsome. But I also grow the ordinary one. I, I like them all. Oh, yes, this everybody has, I do believe, I hope. This was once regarded as a weed, but then gardeners discovered it and it became very, very, very fashionable. This is Verbena bonariensis, and I think you will find it in every garden that you ever visit these days. It's a wonderful plant for bees. As you can see, there's my ginger bee coming in to have a feast. That's Bombus pasquorum, 
and um, and isn't she gorgeous with her tongue out ready? By this stage, I'm coming to August and now into September and October. Michaelmas daisies, how can one do without them? But I was so lucky. This particular form is Ericoides. And I spotted it in a garden of a neighbor of mine. And I had the cheek to say, and could I possibly have a slip of that lovely white aster that you have? Well, this is the easiest plant and the most popular plant for my bees that I have at this time of the year. We're going September into October. There's not a lot in flower at that stage. And this thing puts up dozens and dozens and dozens of white daisies, just perfect for the bees. So if, as we did last year, you have really a pretty bad end of the summer, good start, bad end of the summer, bees hungry. It's not just a matter of having to feed them with sugar syrup. It may be a matter of getting sure that they have enough pollen going in for them to have good winter bees. And this little aster, this little Michaelmas daisy, I, I have to recommend it, though it runs about everywhere, but it's easy to pull out if you don't want it. Aster ericoides, there she is. Mm. When I talk about this plant, I get two reactions. One is people who say, she must be lying. <laughs> and the others say, I want a bit of it. The ones who think I'm lying, hear me say, as I do, this picture was taken late November. This plant will not stop flowering. When I was a girl, I lived in Australia and I remember seeing Lavendula dentata with the, you can see the sort of uh, shape of the leaves is not normal lavender. I remember seeing it growing there and always assumed that it was tender. And then I'd say about maybe 10 years ago, I found a bush of it on Black Rock Market. And of course I had to buy it. This plant here in Bray, where I live, doesn't stop flowering at any time of the year. This is such a boon. I can find a bumblebee or a honeybee any day when there is a bit of sunshine. I don't understand it. It is a shrubby sort of a rather scruffy lavender. It's not a showy plant. It smells divine, of course, as all lavenders do. But I wouldn't swap it out for the prettiest lavender you can ever find because it just serves my bees when there may be very, very little out there for them. Of course, the gorgeous scent attracts them. And then when the uh, flowers die, I clip off the heads and they make lovely, I don't know if you make potpourri, but it makes a lovely little dish of potpourri for the house if you want. So here I am coming down to the back end of the year, moving into November, and here I am in December, as Mahonia just starts flowering, and again, the beautiful strong scent, clusters of flowers for the bees, racemes we call those, with a whole string of flowers coming out in succession, not all at once, and the bees, if they're out, finding food just when they need it. So here we are at Christmas, and my last plant is the first one again, Daphne Bolua. She will be flowering many years at Christmas, and she goes on for, for till February, and that's my whole year. But I wanted to add one more plant, if it's all right with you. And this is a plant to kind of answer a question that gardeners have, but also to give you a kind of view, a sort of a view of, of not having bare soil in your garden. And the plant is here. This is the old dead nettle. This one is the yellow dead nettle, Lamian galeoptilum. And as you can see, it has rather elegant leaves. It's extremely popular with the bees. They're foraging in it now. It's in flower March, April. I think didn't come into April this year, just coming in now. No, maybe just a bit at the end of March. Now this is a very good ground cover plant. It is rampant. But I call it a good plant because you can pull it up with great ease. If you don't want it there, you just pull it out and stick it in the compost heap. It's fine. It has no prickles. The roots are not difficult. And 
If you leave it wherever it goes, it will flower. It'll flower in the deep shade. It'll flower in the patch where it got out into the lawn. It'll flower anywhere. And it's all there for the bees. Um, so let me say, planting ground cover is a difficult art. You can use ivy for ground cover, but ivy growing along the ground does not flower. Ivy only flowers when she gets her head up and becomes a little tree. As you will have noticed, she flowers on walls. She flowers when she can go up, but she doesn't flower when she's just crawling along the ground. Good ground cover though she is. I have found the lamium will even cope with the ivy. I've got quite a lot of ivy in the garden because I like bees. And the lamium can cover up the ivy, just like the old clematis up the wall, the clematis rose that I showed you earlier. It could cope. The ivy isn't killed, but it doesn't have to be seen all the year. And the lamium comes up through it and gives me a show and gives the bees food. So that's pretty well it from me. Um, I would like to know if there are questions and what you think. Thank you very much, Mary. <clears throat> that was really interesting. Um, I have some of those plants myself, but um, I think I'm going to go looking for a whole bunch of other ones. Um, anyway, we have a few questions. Um, let's see. Here, the first one is, what are the best garden flowers to attract bees to the garden? That's, that's difficult. I, I simply can't answer that. Um, a lot depends on where your garden is. For example, if you have a very sunny garden, you won't have any problem attracting bees into your garden. A lot of the shrubby things that I've been talking about are much more obliging. Um, they will more or less grow anywhere. Uh, obviously, if you have a lot of deep shade, you're not going to be able to grow much in the way of flowers. So one way and another, I would strongly suggest that you actually do go to the pollinator plan and look at the gardens one. I had quite a bit to do with putting that list together, in fact. There is quite a lot of information about uh, plants for bees. The main thing, as I want to emphasize, is not to have bare earth, not to have F1 hybrids, and for goodness sake, try not to use, in fact, don't use chemicals, not slug pellets, right? Don't use chemicals in your garden if you want your garden to thrive as a biodiverse area. Thank you. Um, next one is, I understood that rhododendron was poisonous to honeybees. Yes, that's why I was so surprised. You're quite right. And I had read that as well, but it made me go and research it. In fact, that story is quite an interesting one. Apparently there was um, a Greek army that was marching and they came, I've forgotten the actual Greeks, but they came across uh, hives of honeybees in an area where there was nothing growing except rhododendron planticum, the, the ordinary native rhododendron. And the soldiers were very, very, very hungry and they took the honey out of the hives and they ate it and they all died. That's one story. Now, the other part of the story is if you go further with the research, they all fell asleep. So they all acted drugged. That's much more like the truth. There is some element of truth in that, that the, um, the honey does, or the nectar, does contain some uh, chemicals which are actually capable of stunning the bees. So yes, I've always understood, as you did, that they don't go for rhododendrons. But there they were in my bush. That was Corbiensi, I think, that one, that huge, it's got big temple bell uh, type rhododendron. Um, and they were zumming in and out and happy as Larry. So I'm afraid I don't quite believe the old Greeks. Um, so I have so much oxide daisy each year, which I thought were good for bees, but I've never yes. seen a honeybee on them. Why is that? Well, I can't answer that. Have you a hive near? Yeah, that's that really is the key question, I think, because we have lots of oxides and lots of bees on them, and I have lots of be bees nearby. No, I have great sympathy. I, I have a plant that I planted spe specifically for the bees, right? It's called Uriops, and I've never seen a bee on it. But when I went to the zoo, to Dublin Zoo, 
I found big bushes of Uriops, it's a beautiful golden daisy, um, and they were covered in bees. So I have to say, bees ain't all the same. That's what I think. Um, <clears throat> your bumblebee was on a blue pulmonaria. I thought yes. the blue ones were pollinated and the new flowers were pink. You may be right, I'm not sure. Um, I thought it was the other way around, but I, I could be wrong. The buds are pink, and then it sort of goes purpley when it's over, doesn't it? And then down to pink at the end, I think. I, I'm not sure, I, I stand to be corrected. Um, I am a keen vegetable grower for many years. What would you think are the best for bees? Well, beans, obviously, grow beans up a pole. They love beans and they love those flowers. Beans and peas, of course, all of that. Um, a lot of the vegetables you grow, you won't really want them to be pollinated. You won't particularly want to be pollinating your potatoes, will you? And I'd say you'd hate to be pollinating any lettuce or any cabbage. So what I suggest is if you want to make your patch very attractive to bees, and it would be nice, then why don't you grow some herbs or a, or a catch crop, as my uncle used to call it, between the rows of the things which are not going to be bee friendly and put in some flowering plants. So you'll get the best of both worlds. You'll get some flowers in there which will bring in the bees and all your beans and maybe your little fruit tree, maybe some black currants. Raspberries do so well if you have any bees around, anything like that. Just put in some flowering plants and attract the bees. Um, ornamental quince flowers in April are really well visited by honeybees. Just a comment. Absolutely, it does. Quite right. Um, Canomalies, most beautiful plant, all sorts of colours, um, absolutely lovely. I do have a white one, um, and I don't, I, I couldn't include everything. <laughs> yes. um, <coughs> uh, I noticed a good few of my bees on the soil in a pot of primula today, and then they went to a pot of heather in flower beside it. What are they doing on the soil? I can't answer that. Um, I, well, I'm assuming that the pots were in the sun from what you're saying. And one of the things that I've noticed at the moment is how vital it is, I notice this with the bumblebees, for them to find a place to warm themselves. Now, I think that the soil will probably be warmer than the air at the moment. Um, the soil did warm up a little bit last week, as you probably would remember, and any sunshine will heat the, the, the dark earth more quickly than it heats the air, obviously. So I, I strongly suspect that what you were looking at was bees finding a bit of warmth before they flew off again. I've noticed this myself with bumblebees flying to white window frames, which are in the sun. And clearly there's no value to them in the window frame, but it has been a very constant thing I've noticed um, as the weather turned colder, that they, any sun would bring bumblebees onto my window frames, yeah, for, for the warmth. There's a comment here saying that the soil for moisture. Sorry? There was a comment saying that they, go to soil for moisture. Yes, I'm sure they could. I don't know. They tend to pick up drops of moisture. Um, I don't know how they would manage to extract it from soil, but or there may have been moisture in the leaves. Um, somebody commenting that heathers are alive with, with honey or with bees at the moment. Yes, they are indeed. Those beautiful winter flowering heathers, they're splendid. So what are the best hedging plants? I've planted blackthorn, hawthorn, and hazel. Well, they're all good. Uh, but I, if you're talking a sort of uh, town gardens, let me recommend Escalonia. Escalonia has a long flowering season and you can chop it right down and it'll come straight back and it will flower. as all shades of pinky right through to dark red. Um, it's, it's a a plant which is heavily connected with Kilmacara, where a number of varieties were bred. Um, so one way or another, you know, um, it doesn't have to be just the, um, those uh, hedgerow plants. You can have beautiful garden plants, which are very good for the bees. And I would recommend Escalonia as a hedge. Now, coming along depends on the function of your hedge. 
If you want a hedge to keep out small boys, holly. The bees love holly. It flowers in May. It's a very useful bee plant. Um, so get yourself some holly, make sure that you get female and male, and then you'll be away. You'll have some flowers that will keep the little boys out. So next question, are, are the, the mentioned plants in your talk, are they slug and snail resistant? No, I would say most of them are rampant sort of creatures and don't notice slugs and snails very much. You would have seen in my picture of the fennel that there was a little snail in the fennel. I'm afraid I've, I've been in this garden now for over 30 years and I kind of got to the stage where I don't really worry about slugs and snails. They do, they do damage my seedlings. I will admit that. I struggle with them with very young plants. But on the whole, again, growing things from seed, taking slips from things, being a right meanie, doesn't worry me that much and I try again. So what I find is that once the plants really get themselves properly established, although there are slugs and snails all around the garden, I value them. I value them because I know what a good job they're doing cleaning up. They are what we call detritivores. That means rubbish eaters. And they eat up quite a lot of dead matter. I'm not just talking about dead vegetable matter, right? Slugs have teeth. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> but they are pretty good cleaners. And the garden needs these things. So um, I would ask you to have a good look and um, see if it's really the slugs that are doing so much damage. In fact, we have, I think, some seven or eight different varieties of garden slugs. And of those, really only two are, are a problem. There are the little keel slugs that will attack your spuds. They're a nuisance. But then if you're gardening for potatoes, you know all about that. And there is another one. But the big squishy ones that you can so easily catch, they're just eating dead matter. Really, if I can persuade you to worry less about the slugs and snails, I think I'll have done you a service. Uh, somebody's confirming that you're right about the pulmonaria when pollinated, they turn pink. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hi, I'm looking for a shrub that will create coverage at the front of the garden that is next to a public path. Yes. But I'm looking for something that flowers, that bees like. What do you think? Well, it depends to some extent on whether you're prepared to have a mixed hedge. So I was going to say maybe you could plant several different shrubs that will sort of go together, meld into each other. I'm a terrible person for overplanting. Um, I, I actually believe in it <laughs> because what I've discovered, having the same garden for a long time, is that although it can be a little slow for some of them, the other ones will come in more quickly and then they grow together. So I would strongly suggest if you want to grow a sort of keep, keep the public out hedge, that you think in terms of what you want. Um, obviously, you won't want to let privet flower, but privet is very good for bees. Escalonia will do you, it's a nice evergreen hedge, it has the flowers, but then why don't you think of some of those lovely roses? Um, if you want to keep people out, there's nothing like roses, right? The roses which have those big cup-shaped open flowers, um, they, they will easily um, flower among other things. That is their habit in nature. So obviously, yes, um, things like hawthorn, the blackthorn. I've noticed the blackthorn in the hedgerows now where the hedgerows have been savagely cut Nonetheless, the blackthorn is still putting out blossom so bravely. Um, they, there are so many good flowering plants. You could get a whole season in a single hedge if you just overplant a bit. Um, so somebody says poached egg, presumably this poached, poached egg plants. Limanthes, yes. Poached egg plants are brilliant. Anywhere you have a little space among your plants and you want some brilliant bee plants, plant Limnanthes douglasi. Plant is not the word for it. Just get the seed and sprinkle it around. That will come up. They're like little beautiful 
moments of sunshine. The bees adore it. They are the easiest thing in the world and very good for pollinators. What do you use for a weed killer instead of Roundup? Hands, shears. I don't try to kill the weeds chemically. I do very much believe in putting down a heavy mulch. So where I want, like I have a bed, I do have a bed, right? It's not just masses of shrubs. I do have a bed and where I want to have something to plant and I want a bit of clear ground, I put down a heavy mulch. And what I mean by heavy mulch, it can be wood chips. It needn't, it needn't rot down quickly. It, now, I know this is a little bit, um, no, I don't know if it's controversial. Uh, gardening opinion, as far as I can understand it, has come round to, under, to say that actually mulching is more valuable than um, you know, losing the nutrients out of the soil, even grass clippings. So my advice to you, if you really want to suppress your weeds is get some sheets of newspaper and put them down on top of the weeds and then put your grass cuttings and your old leaves and some wood chips. Put that on top and see if they can come up through that. I bet they won't. Um, next one. Uh, gr Grizzelina is a fantastic hedging plant, uh, yes. hedging shrub. My bees covered in summer, there are no flowers, but they collect something. Yes, it's the sweetness. There is a sweetness there. Some plants have things called ex extra floral nectaries as well, so you, you wouldn't see that. Yes, grizzlyna doesn't flower, so it, it isn't uh, an, um, a, a pollen plant at all. Um, see now. Actually, I think what they're, that what they're foraging is probably from green fly. It's probably, um, it's probably like wasps. You see the wasps cleaning the leaves as well. Um, the green fly will uh, deposit a sweet, sticky substance, yeah. which we all know as honeydew. Um, that's probably what's on the leaves for the bees to forage. Um, Mertus communis can be used to make small hedges rather than using box and have pungent flowers in late winter. Yes, and it's beautiful, isn't it? I do agree. I have a myrtle. Um, I think they're a little bit slow to get started. I don't know how yours was. Um, mine now at 30 years old is a lovely, lovely bush. And the Ceanothus as well is very, very good for, for if you want a low hedge, you can put the, 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 sh the low form of Ceanothus and get beautiful blue flowers in May. It's really lovely. Mm. <clears throat> Speaking of people repellent hedges, how is, how is Pyracantha for uh, bees? For very good. And it has massive and ghastly thorns, right? So that is a little boy stopper as well. Um, if you've got pyracantha, let me just warn you, don't uh, go pruning it without gloves and mind your eyes. Um, if I use garlic and water to deter some pests, will the smell of the garlic put off the bees? No. I, I can answer that quite plainly. No, the bees won't be put off. They won't, they don't identify things in the way we do. <laughs> they don't cook for a start. <laughs> yes. Do, over in, um, do you recommend any aquatic flowering plants for bees? Now that's a very good question. No, I'm no use at all to you on aquatic flowering plants. Um, the only the only ones I've I've grown have been water lilies. Um, and you can see that they're pollinated by beetles. Um, I have grown irises uh, in, in a pond, which were very rampant, but I never saw honeybees going in there, only bumblebees. So I'm, I'm not really very useful to you that, on that. The, the um, marigolds, the marsh marigolds, I think attract bees, but that's really, they grow in mud rather than, than in depths of water, don't they? I don't know. I think you should look that one up. I'm sorry. I, I'm not really useful for that. Mm. <clears throat> Here's a question. And actually, I, I, I have a question about how do you pronounce this correctly? Is it cotone aster or cot cotton easter? And is it any good for bees? Well, I know it is. <laughs> I don't know whether it's correct, but I've always heard it as cotone aster. Yeah. And they love it. It covers itself in those little white flowers. And then later on, you get the berries. 
that's a very good ground cover plant, a splendid little hedge. It's a really tough little plant that. I've just got two, two delivered there in the past few, uh, past couple of weeks, so mm. and I haven't put them down yet. Anyway. In fact, you know, one of the saddest things I've ever been involved with was trying to get bees out of um, a, a, a place in the ground where there was a pump, right? And the pump needs servicing and some bees have gone in there. They'd gone through the uh, manhole cover, the little tiny manhole cover, and they'd gone in and they'd made a proper nest with, with, uh, with uh, uh, proper uh, combs. And I know that the reason they did that was that all around that on this industrial site, there was nothing but cotoniaster. They planted cotoniaster to beat the band. And I could see what happened. The bees thought this was paradise. Um, other than lavender, is there something else that flowers all, all year? Well, no, not immediately. I can't say that this, uh, that lavender I think is crazy. I don't understand it. Um, and I do think it's something to do with the fact that here in Bray, I'm only a mile from the sea, we have a very moderate climate. Um, but okay, let me encourage you. Why don't you just um, give it a go? Try um, some lavender, lavendula dentata if you can. And um, you could always write to me and I could send you a slip or two, for example. I, I proselytize about this plant because I, I just find it so useful. But um, apropos, um, I would say, um, I don't know anything which actually flowers reliably all year round. And that one shouldn't. I'm sure it shouldn't, but it does. Of course, maybe. Yes, well, you're right, Brendan, you're so right. That lovely old saying, when gorse is out of blossom, kissing's out of season. Somebody says, I grow lots of catmint instead of lavender as the flowers for much longer. It still looks amazing. Yes, it does. It, it, the catnip is wonderful. All the nepetas are very good for bees. And it's, it, it's, there are questions on the chat and it's really, really hard to find them. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, a lot of people are saying, thank you very much. Um, the bees visiting the pots, apparently the, the, they had been watered a little bit earlier, so they were wet. Yes. So it could be collecting water. Anyway, uh, I want to thank you very much for your time, Mary. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and just let everybody know, I'll post up all the names of the of the plants up on the YouTube channel with the recording. So thank you everybody for coming along and thank you again, Mary. And uh, good night. <laughs> night.